going on, everybody? It's your boy, the Lo-Fi Horror Guy. Welcome to another episode of the Lo-Fi Horror Guys Growing On You Live. Today, we're going to have the one and only Ted Nikolau. Hokey pokey. Okay. okay. All right. Here we go, Ted. All right. Yeah. I, yeah. There we phone's go. plugged in and everything? Yeah, I got it all set now. Okay, cool, <laughs> Beautiful. man. Beautiful. Beautiful. First off, thank you so, so much for taking the time today, sir. I appreciate it, man. Hey, man. My pleasure. Yeah. So if, if you haven't seen the show before, basically we have a couple of icebreaker questions in the beginning. The rest of the interview is all about you and your, your craft, your work over the years. And then uh, I have one finale question that I wrote just specifically for you. So if you're all ready, <laughs> okay. sir, we're yeah, going go to dig right into it. Okay. So let me ask, you know, my wife and I do some traveling. And if, if we were traveling through Texas, what's a, what's a local food staple or a local a restaurant that you would tell us we have to stop by before we left? Oh, I'd say you, first of all, if you're going to go to Texas, you have to just go to Austin. Austin is the okay. coolest place in Texas. Uh, there you have to eat some Tex-Mex at El Rancho, Matt's El Rancho. Ooh, uh, okay. Their chili rellano is incredible. And you have to go eat barbecue, either at Snow's, which is uh, outside of Austin, or another place in Taylor called uh, Louis Mueller's Barbecue is oh, the greatest. Okay. Yeah, very authentic and old school in a little uh, town that's like a town out of uh, Last Picture Show. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Now, are you still currently in Texas? I know you grew up in there, but uh... I grew up in Texas, but I live in Los Angeles. I've lived here okay. for like a long since the seventies. Okay, I got you. I got you. I knew that you had moved out, but I was trying to hone it down, and I couldn't quite spot it. But you know, I wanted to ask Texas too because I mean, there's tons of really cool stuff there, and uh, you know, especially the food. You know, I, I I always have to ask about local staples to my guests. Yeah, Tex Mex and barbecue are the things to are the things to go go to. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. So so now another thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, as far as your horror origin. So you know, early on, your dad brought you to you know like Saturday matinees in Dallas. Yeah, uh -huh. you guys saw some monster movies. You 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 you, you saw some some early on horrors. What was uh you know what was your favorite horror or what was your favorite movie in that experience or you know just experience in those Saturday mornings in general? I think uh, you know um, my favorite things were the the flying saucer invasion movies uh, okay. and uh, uh, those always kind of sparked me and Texas had so many great old kind of country roads that you could go out and you know hope that you would find a flying saucer so <laughs> basically those were my favorites and then you know the staples frankenstein and uh you know those movies on you know saturday night uh tv late night tv kind of sure. like were inspirational to me too okay okay awesome now what was the first horror movie that you ever saw Oh, man. Can, can you remember digging real, real, real deep? Digging way back. Uh, oh, man, it was probably Frankenstein on TV, even before my dad started taking me to see uh, movies. Okay. One of our super favorites was uh, was um, uh, uh, Forbidden Planet. Oh, he, yeah. He okay. was a psychiatrist, and so he really dug the id monster, and, and uh, so we went to see that quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All and right. I really loved uh, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers and also um, uh, Invaders from Mars was another Ooh, real inspirational yes. film. The original so, one, the 50s one. Right, right. Did, did you like the remake that Toby Hooper did? I liked it okay, but the, the first one uh, was so cool and expressionistic and minimal and, and yet terrifying you know yeah, that it, i think sure. it really rules you know <laughs> right right a lot of times i mean that's something that's you know way more effective it's just the simplistic you know like minimal kind of approach to things that can be way more terrifying than things right in your face yeah definitely man definitely let's see sure. if i can set this phone down there we go oh go. <laughs> that's like little looming yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what, what what was like what was you know your your local movie uh experience what were the theaters you know what were the theaters like did you have some that were you know just a little bit you know like a cheaper one and two type thing tell us about those oh man back then it was like one theater and one building and uh you know there was a, a theater in my neighborhood at the shopping center that uh, i saw the tingler at and oh, then there man. was a See, I grew up in Dallas, and on Greenville Avenue, there was the Greenville Theater that uh, was kind of like even kind of run down back, back then, 
Uh, but it was the one that had the great Saturday matinees. Okay. Okay. Now, what, you mentioned the Tingler. Did they do anything special with, like, the, the, the presentation of that? I know yeah, there, was, the, there was mentions the, that they would, like, have people blowing on your neck or something. Or <laughs> I think something they had crazy. little vibrators in the seats. Um, oh, okay. So the, the – and I never got one of those seats that vibrated, so I, I can't testify to how terrifying it was. But, sure. but that was pretty cool. And then there was 13 Ghosts where the ghost kind of flew across the <laughs> – the uh, overhead the audience it was pretty pretty amazing <laughs> right right well, that's cool that's cool that's really fun i just know i mean it was funny that you mentioned that because that was one that i remember hearing kind of you know people bringing a 4d experience was people mentioning the tingler and having you know something else going on in the theater you know to yeah, make it extra yeah. scary <laughs> yeah because uh, it was all kind of a and that movie was scary anyway because you could right. sort of feel the tingle going up your spine you know when you got scared yeah. and then kind of having the scene in the movie theater at which point people in the in the audience started screaming because they could feel the <laughs> vibration <laughs> pretty pretty spectacular yeah okay okay if you could break down three scenes in horror in general in general that have just forever ingrained in your brain you know ever since you saw them what would what would you say three scenes are that just forever stuck in your head since you watched uh, I think it's the kid in Invaders from Mars seeing the the, the UFO kind of land and the little rise beyond yeah. the hill. Yeah. Uh, probably the the killer in the red Mac kind of turning around at the end of Don't Look Now. Oh uh, yeah, which okay. is like sent chills up and down my <laughs> brain, man. Um, and the third is probably just the 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 electrical storm cacophony of Frankenstein was so inspiring. But uh, you know what? I'd have to also give it to uh, uh, Earth versus Flying Saucers. The destruction of Washington monuments was like another really amazing sequence, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's always something that's a trip, too, is seeing, you know, like different monuments or a certain place. Or even the, a recent Godzilla movie tore apart uh, Boston which I think was kind well, of the first yeah, thing, yeah. you know, they hadn't, hadn't ever shot that. And that was kind of, you know, crazy yeah, you know, seeing that, the baseball stadium and such. Yeah, that stuff never, never loses its appeal. You know, just the, the destruction of giant buildings, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, earlier in, in your days, you've mentioned in, in uh, another interview, and I wanted to touch on this a little bit. You've mentioned making shorts when you were in high school, you know, with buddies and friends and different things. So now if you could remake one of those, with the knowledge and means that you have today, what would you remake, and what is it? What is it called? What's it about? You know, we did, the the filming that we did when we were teenagers was more about pranking people around us, and uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't think they could be remade because we were pretty <laughs> stupid little hippy dippy kids, you know. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 that's that's fun stuff just because i uh, that was you know my my upbringing was me and my buddies just trying to conjure up how we can make the silliest cheapest blood and you know hit somebody over a fake bat you know over the head with a fake uh, bat right. or something uh -huh. so yeah, yeah. i didn't know if there's anything that you would make nowadays that'd be like you know what i'd try to redo this again no i did a film in uh in uh, university of texas called southern hospitality that was kind of like a story of families uh, uh, the world like a 40 days of rain that was flooding uh, cities all over America and people and refugees kind of coming and taking over the homes of, of people that were living living in the homes uh, I, I would remake that movie because I think that's like a kind of uh, like up to date you know yeah. the idea of that that's it. Yeah. unfortunately it hasn't gone out of style yet <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> or irrelevant you know so to speak uh, yeah. Now, in, early on in your directing days, you know, as far as, you know, what were what were some personal key learning points to you uh, that you had to learn early on that you keep even nowadays? You know, maybe, maybe something just to tell even, you know, new filmmakers. Uh, I think the, the most important thing we learned in film school, uh, especially was to prepare, to prepare, you know, make shot lists, even if you don't. Uh, abide by them once you get on the set because once you get on the set you know you rehearse with actors and you see a different way to shoot a scene but if you go in prepared with some 
uh, idea of what it is you need to do, you're always able to kind of uh, to kind of stay with the schedule because uh, staying with the schedule is kind of the most important thing in terms of being able to work again and again. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. And that, I mean, there's, there's lots of different variables to all of that, but I mean, those are really good things. And, you know, speaking with somebody that's a filmmaker, I really wanted to ask cause I have different friends that are directors and, you know, up and coming filmmakers and different uh -huh. things that, that watch. And, uh, you know, that those are, those are really good, good points and things that, uh, you know, are, are wise to hear. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And working with actors is like the other thing that's like right. super, I mean, that's your, that's your main goal you know is to get a performance out of actors without squashing their own creativity you know sure can can you tell us about a time you know where possibly you had a vision in your head and you said look this is how i want the scene to go and maybe you know an effects person or or an actor said uh, <laughs> i think if we do it like this it would pay out better and you know you kind of you know work together a little bit on that and it, it ended up doing so uh, yeah, you know, when we were doing uh, subspecies, I guess number three, uh, yeah. Honest Hove was, you know, had, had embodied the character of Radu so incredibly well. Uh, there's the scene after he uh, beheads Mummy. You know, you know <laughs> yeah. the scene. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and, he, and his speech is something about, now I have it all, pretty one, don't I? I killed my mother, my father, my brother for you. Uh, and in my mind, it was uh, going to be delivered in that same kind of Radu insane tone. Uh, and Honest, when we uh, were setting up the shot, said, you know, maybe this would be better if I, if I played it like I was completely depleted now and I was exhausted and depressed about it all. And he did that. And he kind of sinks into his chair and, and delivers that speech. And it was quieter than i imagined and so much more powerful yeah and yeah. and also okay. wow. uh, the emotion of it was was much more palpable too you know yeah wow <laughs> okay yeah that's that's incredible that's an awesome story too i love hearing that yeah that's you know i mean sometimes you got to listen to uh, obviously you got to listen to the actors because they they bring a lot to the game you know mm -hmm. Huh. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I love hearing, you know, that aspect, you know, as far as from, from firsthand, uh, you know, cause there are certain times where you speak with people and they're like, no, you know, this is exactly how I want the shot to be. This is how I want this to be spoken and addressed. But there's other times, you know, like that, where, you know, it comes, something comes to light and they mention, Hey, maybe if I do it like this and it, I mean, that scene definitely pans out. So that's awesome to hear that, you know, that was ultimately uh, decided on. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was very cool in that way, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting back together with him as soon as the pandemic is uh, over. Oh yeah, okay, okay. With the with with the movies that you've worked on over the years, do you have any sort of you know priceless pieces that you've kept uh, from from productions? No, I was really stupid and didn't. I'm not a collector type, uh, and okay. so I don't clutter my life with a, a bunch of stuff. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, but. I, I kick myself now that I didn't uh, at least take one of the pieces of erotic art that were on the walls of the Putterman house oh, television. Yeah. That would yeah. have been amazing <laughs> to own a few of those pieces. Okay. And I would have loved to have the bloodstone from, uh, from subspecies. Oh, but that's man. somehow disappeared in, over time, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. No. so it keeps oh. changing from film oh. to film, you know. Like num the one in uh, two and three, I think, was the most perfect of the you know like jewel like uh, setting for the bloodstone and uh subspecies four uh the production designer um you know talked me into uh letting him design it on a uh 3d printer and so it just had a much clunkier less handmade vibe to it you know oh really well wow. it was made on a 3d printer yeah yeah huh wow no kidding That's early crazy. version early version yeah Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, with the practical effects and amazing gore, uh, you know, through throughout your, your movies and just career in general, let me ask, you know, what are some personal favorites and possibly even what was one of the more difficult ones to pull off? Uh, you know, I think uh, the monster of television to me is like the most complicated kind of puppeteering job that was done in any of my films. And yet, uh, it's he has so much uh, personality thanks to the 
to the sculptors and the puppeteers who were actually operating him. So, sure. so for me, that's like one of the, you know, it, it's, you know, he's a monster that's just kind of like a big booger, you know, booger. But, he's, <laughs> but he's, he's got a lot of moving parts and a lot of uh, actual, you, you can sort of feel for him, you know. Sure. Uh, I think in subspecies two and three, uh, the uh, the gore effects that uh, that uh, Wayne and uh, Norman did, they were the the makeup effects artists, were pretty pretty spectacular. You know, all all of my films are obviously super duper low budget and and uh, suffer from that a little bit, but you know, with the help of the people that that really care about what they're doing, you know, they sort of, they manage to work, I think. Yeah, it pushes minds alike, you know, I mean, there's sometimes that, you know, people, you know, uh, bring up budget and things, but I, I, I truly think that a lot of times it, you know, pushes people to really come together and get that end goal, you know, brought to something uh, a lot more fun and tasteful than something that's got a, you know, a, a, a what a, a transformers you know tight budget or something like that you know i mean it just it takes a little bit of the spirit out of it yeah i get tired of just watching what appears to be a very high resolution cartoon in front of my <laughs> eyes you know and right, it was always right. a, one of the challenges was to to find locations that actually express the emotion of what you're trying to the, of the story you're trying to tell so i think right. it, you know when we started shooting in in romania that was you know it, it was there in front of your eyes and it and it inspired kind of the the crew and the actors and it also you know you see it on the screen and it's real you know yeah oh yeah for sure that's actually kind of a you know a perfect segue into my next question as far as you know you shooting in Romania and and not only that but you know what are some challenges as far as being uh you were the first American to film in post-communist Romania correct yeah yeah Okay. Uh, so what what were like what just I guess give us a little idea of how somebody <laughs> can wrap their mind around that. There's so yeah. many things to ask with all that. Uh you know, Charlie Band sent me to Romania. Uh first off, we had the script and we knew we were gonna try to make this vampire movie called Subspecies. Uh but none of us had ever been to Romania and um so like in the summer, which was, you know, like six months after the revolution, uh, this guy named Jan Ionescu, uh, who had been living in the States, uh, kind of put together a deal where and proposed it to Charlie that he could, that the Romanian film industry would pay for the Romanian costs and Charlie would pay for the American costs. And so he sent me over there to to meet the people and scout locations and see if I felt like it uh, it was a viable proposition. Um, I went over there and in those days, you know, the, the city was gray. There was no color. There was no advertising. You could barely find anything in the, in the stores. Uh, the, everything seemed a little bit sinister and, uh, the hotel lobbies were missing light bulbs. And so everything was dark and shadowy. And there were like, uh, secret police spies kind of sitting in the bars and, prostitutes huddled in the bars and, and biz <laughs> businessmen coming and going. But it all seemed very kind of like sinister dealings were happening everywhere. Uh, and so I went there and met uh, Vlad Taunescu and Juana Tofan, who are now married, who own Castell Film Studios now, where a lot of production goes on but at the uh -huh. time he was a poor cinematographer she was a poor costume designer but brilliant and uh he didn't speak english and she spoke a little broken english uh -huh. and jan ionescu kind of put us together and uh we ended up really liking each other a lot and traveled together around the country and looked at locations and in a way it was uh you know you'd go into a restaurant and the food was not very good and you know chicken chickens <laughs> were not cooked to the proper 165 degrees oh and no <laughs> everything was a little bit wanting to make you sick always you know so i always yeah. traveled with anti diarrhea medication <laughs> because i got sick so many times over there but vlad and wana introduced me to the theater scene took me to see a play at the national theater and uh and after the play was over to the 
bar restaurant where that kind of served actors at a discount, uh, which was the most lively, crazy, drunken, wonderful, artistic scene that I've ever been around, you know. Uh, so, so there was this gray, sad city of poor people and uh, bad haircuts and, you know, <laughs> bad clothes. And then on the other hand, there was this vibrant artistic theatrical scene that that involved people with great senses of humor and vast quantities of cheap wine. Uh, so wow. uh, I went from being a little bit scared of the whole place and thinking that it was really sad to understanding kind of the importance of art in a society that's been so kind of held down for so long. Uh, oh, wow. And once I got to hang out with some of the actors and Jan Hai Duke it turned into a really great friend. And um, so, so there was that initial kind of uh, change in my perception of the whole place of from being gray and horrible to, to having this underbelly of great people. Then we traveled around the country and saw the locations and, Every place we went had the same problems. The restaurants were crappy. The, but you know, you could buy bar uh, beer in the middle of the street or get sausages, little sausage stands. And and wow. I I got the, you know, because Vlad is such a man of Romania, uh, he proudly introduced me to whatever was good in the country and and really kept me from going crazy in those in those weeks of of uh, prepping the movie, uh, sure. and. And once I saw the locations that we were going to be able to shoot in, you know, it was like I was hooked on the whole idea of coming back to Romania. And the process sure. of shooting there, the, the biggest challenge was the crews, uh, you know, there was very little equipment or, uh, you know, they had a vibrant film industry, but their equipment was like back from the 50s, practically. Uh, okay. So I realized that we were going to be shooting with limited, you know, crappy dollies and, and, uh, <laughs> not very much grip equipment and silks and things to control the light outdoors. Um, but the crew, uh, you know, the, the key grip and the gaffers and, and all of that were really adept at, at making do with what they had. So I realized that the movie itself was going to be kind of like a weird European chamber movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And once I accepted that, uh, it all kind of fell into place. And then the, the other biggest challenge was uh, money wasn't always forthcoming to pay the crew uh, week by week. So they were, there were constant kind of like uh, revolutions, many revolutions going on. And, and uh, so uh, it was, you know, every day was a challenge of waiting, waiting while everybody tried to get paid, waiting to make sure we got the film stock sent to us on time. Uh, so it was like a real, you know, it was an experience. And, and by the time it was over, I was like, holy shit, get me <laughs> out of this fucking place. Uh, but the minute you get home after a situation like that, uh, you're addicted. All, all, yeah, all the bad memories kind of fade and all the good memories remain. And, and sure. I couldn't wait to go back for two and three. Oh, okay. Now, was the, the, the fourth one wasn't shot there? The fourth one was shot there, but it was oh, shot okay. years later. So we shot okay. number one in like 1990, number mm -hmm. two and three in 92, I believe. And then it wasn't until like 1997, I think, that we shot uh, the fourth. Okay, sure. And then is it, it's the Vampire Journals, correct? That was one of, that was the kind of sub subset off of it? Yeah, Charlie that, Kane. I'm Go sorry, ahead. I was just going to ask, was that filmed over there as well or no? Yeah, that was filmed there too. Oh, yeah, that wow. was filmed okay. primarily in and around Bucharest, uh, okay. whereas the subspecies films were shot in Bucharest at the in some sound stages and uh, some city streets, but also uh, up in Transylvania. Um, oh, wow. No kidding. In, the, in these mountain towns. And, uh, you know, it was incredible, incredible opportunity. Um, and, the yeah, subspecies for kind of came along. Oh, oh no, uh, Vampire Journals. Uh, Charlie wanted to do a movie. He's, uh, he's a big gambler. So he wanted to do a film that was uh, uh, a, about vampires living under a gambling casino. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I sort of like the idea that vampires are more Nosferatu and, you know, kind of creatures from the grave. But the idea of 
of doing more a more elegant kind of version of vampires appealed to me in a way and so uh so we went and did that film and and that was a, a really good experience too sure now with with the first one you know were there were there a lot of challenges as for at first you know as far as i know you had mentioned um i i believe vlad's wife was a little bit of a help with uh you know the language barrier yeah really uh subspecies one, two, and three, all of them, uh, you know, people did not speak much English. And, and Juana served, you know, when, when Vlad and Juana and I would go to dinner or kind of go to, I would go to their house and commiserate, uh, she would kind of help translate for us. Uh, and then I had a kind of a dedicated interpreter with me at all times, too, to kind of help me communicate with everybody that I needed to communicate with. Um, okay. And then in the, you know, on the day of shooting, really the, what you talk about with the cinematographer is kind of universal in terms of, you know, language isn't so much of a barrier, you know, except in the kind of subtleties, but the basics of a shot and the camera movement and, and all of that are pretty universal. So Vlad and I developed a, a, a pretty good manner of communication. He would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes screaming because because uh, over the shoulder shot was like not in their like cinema vocabulary. I mean, they <laughs> used it, they used it, but they didn't shoot. They didn't call it that, I guess. Uh, and so he would wake up from nightmares screaming over the shoulder, Ted, over the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord you ruined them forever <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> was was there i mean with you know initially going over and it being you know so soon after uh you know such a big change was there a lot of you know was there a lot of eyebrows being raised and kind of looked and you know was it was it uh accepted at first you know how how was that what the idea of a vampire movie or just, just you, a, got you guys coming over and filming and, you know, just uh, the idea of outsiders, you know, coming in, in a sense. Oh, no, I think uh, they they love the idea of outsiders coming okay. in and everyone was super open and friendly. I mean, you know, they they sort of have a at the time kind of this expectation that people were looking down their noses at them because uh, they were, you know, it was a super poor country, uh, but they were really well educated people. Uh, so uh, as long as you didn't come in with that attitude, that kind of snooty, okay. you know, we're better than you attitude, they were all for it, you know, and this, they were some of the nicest, you know, the, the, the key grip was like, you know, just, you know, gigantic strong man who was super smart and adept at engineering challenges. And, you know, everybody really wanted to be a part of the, the action there. Sure. Okay. Awesome. Now, fast forward and, you know, uh, up until, you know, more recently, uh, I recently, probably about a month ago or so, I interviewed Anders and uh, Asia Erickson. Ah, and, cool. and uh -huh. you know, I, I know that that's somebody that you have uh, recently gotten involved with working. Uh, tell me how you guys kind of met and, uh, you know, how you've gotten involved with working with them. Uh, Anders and Asia met Anders Hove uh, at oh, a okay. horror convention a few years back. Uh, and they kind of, because Asia w was such a longtime fan of subspecies mm -hmm. and uh, Anas is another Danish guy, uh, they kind of hit it off and, and got to be friends. And then the next horror convention where Anas, where I was there, Anas and, and uh, Denise and me and Asia and Anas, uh, Erickson were there too. So Okay. Uh, they introduced me. I met them, um, really liked them, uh, thought they were really talented sculptors and, uh, you know, so into the uh, whole subspecies series that over the course of two or three different conventions, you know, we got closer and closer. And um, then uh, I proposed them as a possible, to Charlie, as a possible uh, makeup effects artist for subspecies because I feel like you know, uh, as much as they love the series, they'll give it their all to, to kind of right, right. make it as good as possible. So uh, they're going to be our allies in it. Very good. And now that's that's for uh, the, the new installment, correct? Part yeah, of the, sub, the sub fifth species, one? subspecies five. Yeah, which would be like the the prequel to the to the whole subspecies saga. 
Sweet, sweet. How, how long has that been? And I know it's been, you know, a couple of years that I've seen different little things, you know, that you've, you've talked on. How, how long would you say that's been in the works? Oh, man, I wrote the script back when Full Moon was still uh, operational. So I wrote the script probably in 98 or 99 or 2000, something like that. The original Oh, really? Script. Oh, yeah. Shit. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was that far back. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, then it, and then Full Moon kind of fell apart. And uh, so the script kind of just stayed in my computer and... Uh, and Charlie, you know, kept wanting to make it, but but Honest and Denise and I really did not weren't interested in doing it if it meant you know doing it on a five day schedule or something like that. I can't really right. work like that. Um, so finally, um, Charlie kind of cons you know I think he's sort of back on his feet somewhat and has his streaming full moon channels that are making money for him. And <clears throat> so he proposed like a couple of years ago let's do you know subspecies five now and so i took the script and, and knowing that the budget was going to be low uh kind of toned down some of the ambition of the script and without i hope uh destroying the story the true story of the of the film and um then began the slow process of uh you know make making sure denise and honest were still on board and uh and then you know, again, we were going to shoot it last spring uh, in or even like maybe before I went to I went to Serbia to look at location. No, to uh, Albania to look at locations like a year ago. And uh, we were going to shoot it in the autumn in Albania. And then um, they decided Albania didn't quite have enough uh, castles and kind of the gothic locations that we needed. So the people that are servicing the, 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 the production suggested Serbia, and um, Serbia's got more of the locations we need, but um, then the pandemic hit, and uh, production got postponed once again. So yeah, just keep sitting on the script and yeah. our desire to get out and make it. Right. Okay. And that was part of Charlie Band's. It was uh, like ten films. I'm trying to think of what the what, the what it was called. Ten. Deadly, the Deadly Ten. Deadly Ten. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm oh, not sure okay. how many of the Deadly Ten have actually gotten before cameras yet. I think probably four or five of them. You know. Oh. Hopefully okay. It'll, it'll continue. But I know subspecies is like one of his priorities because you know it's it's one that I think there's enough fans that are waiting to see it. You know, and he's been talking oh, yeah. about it been talking about it so long that uh you know he's got to deliver at some point you know holy moly too much right. light yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure for sure uh, you know and and so this this next bit i kind of wanted to hit on uh you know before our finale here i wanted to ask because i know you know you've mentioned in 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 your younger days you know playing guitar jamming in some bands and i wanted to bring up the fact of you know your your movie bad channels uh, oh yeah, uh -huh. you you had Blue Oyster Cult write a whole goddamn album for the movie. Yeah, that was amazing. That was an amazing find. I didn't. Uh, I think um, our music guy Pat Siciliano suggested them, and I guess they were looking for uh, you know to, something different to do and and to to uh, score a movie. So that was like a a major coup, you know, yeah. that that just that fell into my lap. In, in, yeah, I was going to say, in my, in my research, I had never seen that they had done anything like that. So that was just kind of, I mean, it was just on a whim that they were, you know, how, how did that get connected? Just as I guess as... they were, they were hungry. They must have, uh, Pat Siciliano must have known, known somebody in the band and, or their manager or something and, uh, and put the deal together. And, and <laughs> I, I was like, I'm not a big Blue Oyster Cult like fan at the time, you know, uh, sure. and I went went up to see them in their studio when they had, you know, had some, some of the score roughed out, you know, and, and it was like very droney and, and not very melodic. And, and I was like, well, could, could you guys add some more notes or something? You know, kind of gave them <laughs> some horrible direction that probably <laughs> really pissed them off, you know? <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So did they have to, did they do like a couple of takes, you know, of things that they delivered to you before, uh, you know, you finally got the final product then? Yeah, they, they showed me kind of the, the roughs so that so that I could have a chance to give them some notes. And so that was that was nice of them, you know. 
Oh, sweet. Okay. It, it at first kind of turned in, uh, that was what I was, I was something I wanted to ask was if they at first, you know, tried turning in something more of like an electronic type, you know, goblin score or something like that, or right off the bat, did they write like rock and roll tracks? Yeah, no, they wrote, they wrote it. It was pretty similar to, to the way it turned out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool. And another aspect of that movie, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask a couple of things on this just because I don't hear a whole, I don't hear you talk about it a whole lot. And uh -huh. It's a great little fl flick, you know, it's lots oh, of cool. fun and it's a, it's, a, it's a fun one to have. If, you know, if, if uh, people are watching, it's on the full moon streaming. Uh, I've got it on Amazon Prime and uh, it's, it's on there and remote is on there and all the wow, subspecies. Wow. Uh -huh. and, yeah, lots of cool stuff for sure. Uh, I wanted to ask about the alien design though for, uh, for uh, bad channels. What, what went into that? You know, it looks like, you know, just a, a costume, but then this huge thing on top of uh, the fellow's head. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit. I think the, the whole um, concept of the alien presence in, in Bad Channels was based on fungus, that, the, that oh. it was spewing fungus that kind of coated the, the uh, radio uh, studio. Yeah. And uh, so we just kind of went with a big fungus uh, space helmet um, and uh, I don't know man it's like uh, it seemed so cool at the time and I don't know it, it, with the little uh, glass mask it also reminded me a little bit of like robot monster the the big gorilla yeah. in the in, with the glass face mask um, yeah yeah okay so and, and Mike Deek who the the uh, makeup effects uh, artist played that character because he's a big tall oh, really? thin guy yeah, so it was all about fungus, that, that movie, you know. <laughs> okay. It was a, okay. My magic mushroom days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. All right. That's one that I just don't hear a whole lot mentioned about. And it's definitely one that uh, I suggest to, to friends that bring up, you know, subspecies or they talk about terror vision. I'm like, oh, man, have you seen Bad Channels? And, you that's know, a funny, lot of times man. they don't yeah. hear of it. And that, that's, a, that's a good movie. I love that. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I didn't realize there was there were actual fans for that film because I was like, <laughs> you know, it didn't it wasn't like all that well received when it first came out, you know. But it, you know, it, we put as much as we could into it, and and yeah. I thought Martha Quinn was really really funny, and um, uh, you know, I think it was it was a fun film to shoot, you know, with all the music going on 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 the sound on the sets too. Sure. Okay. What what went into you know you you mentioned some of the casting with that. Uh, did did you have specific people you know in mind for the roles or was that something that you just held the auditions and you had you know you you had a couple of people that you definitely liked. Yeah, we had auditions and and just found everybody that way. Although I think Martha Quinn kind of came you know through that Pat Siciliano connection too. Like okay. she was looking for something to do and and um, we were lucky to get her. You know. For sure, for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, so, so now this is this is wrapping up our interview. Uh, I do have one uh, uh, finale question, but uh, this is your opportunity just to let everybody know what you have going on. You know, uh, currently what's up and coming, and uh, you know, just some of your socials and whatnot. So, this okay. is uh, your time, sir. Okay, man. You can find me on uh, Instagram, Ted Nicolau. You can find me on Facebook, Ted Nicolau. I don't have a website. I have uh, I have um, a Vimeo page that you can kind of look at some of the uh, little things I've done, uh, and uh, basically right now uh, we're waiting for Subspecies Five and eager to get into production on that. I've got a screenplay that I'm kind of working on that's like a supernatural shocker uh, called the the Girl by the Lake, um, and um, oh, just writing and trying to stay sane, cooking, walking my dog, and. Um, getting through it day by day you know yeah yeah <laughs> so you know i i'm kicking myself in the ass i'm gonna have to have you back on because i completely forgot about that movie that you're working on right now and i have a couple of questions but we're uh we're <laughs> running okay, out of yeah. time anytime man let me know <laughs> anytime for sure for sure this has been so so fun uh i do have my finale but i just wanted to think you know thank you first and foremost it's been such an honor and a, and a treat i've had your movies sitting on my shelf in my collection for years and years so 
Uh, okay. Cool. This is awesome, Thanks, man. Thank okay, you so, man. so much. Yeah. So thanks my... for spreading the word. Thanks for spreading the word. <laughs> for yeah. sure. For sure. I, uh, uh, so, so for my finale, you know, I tried to conjure a couple of things. I tried to think of, you know, your work as far as filming your, 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 your movies, uh, earlier days with being a, you know, a rock and roller playing guitar and such. So I wanted to ask you if, if today you were making a, a rock and roll horror musical, all right. If you could have any rock and roll band ever, dead or alive, does, doesn't matter, any rock and roll band ever to score your movie with <laughs> one lead, male or, and female, who would you have in this movie? Whew, that's like a humongous freaking question. I'll tell you what. <laughs> uh, I'll just uh, wing something. Because I'm also working on, uh, uh, I do these like uh, uh, pitch books which, where I take photographs off the internet and and photoshop them and try to uh, create the ambience of a story that i'm trying to tell and, oh, and sure. okay. actors and 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 then you know 50 or 60 pages kind of tells you the story i'm working Sweet. on a project with a, an italian uh, producer friend of mine uh, roberto bessi uh based on carmilla the uh oh, the wow. sheridan lefanu vampire novel that preceded uh dracula by like quarter of a century um and uh in that uh i'm using it, it, it's a it's sort of uh two young 18 year old girls and uh and a, a theatrical production of a kind of expressionistic version of carmilla and uh i'm using uh i'm using um uh Marilyn Manson as kind of my model for the insane oh, director and composer of the thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, my son plays in a band called Drab Majesty. Uh, and okay. they do kind of post-punk, kind of doom wave kind of music. Oh, and, shit. Uh, Sweet. I would get them to compose it because I think they, because there's a rock opera involved. And, and so, <laughs> so that would be my dream project at the moment, man. Wow, sick. That is awesome. What's the band called again? It's called Drab, Drab. Majesty. Majesty. Okay. Yeah. Andrew, Sweet. Sweet. Andrew, it's a band uh, formed by Andrew Klinko and uh, brought my son Alex into it. And uh, they play around the world and you can find their videos online. You can also find their videos now on Night Flight. Huh. Okay. So, I'm is, is, is that like an application or a website? It's a, or? It's a new streaming service, I think, that's uh, oh, for really? kind of alternative music. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sweet. Check them out, Drab Majesty. You can see their videos online, too. They're, they're uh, really something. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I appreciate your, uh, your, your time, Ted. I appreciate your patience with my questions. Hey, uh, Eric, they're good questions, man. Good questions. <laughs> yeah, so uh, anytime you want to do it again, let me know. Absolutely. We, we, we sure will. You, you, you take care and you stay safe. Uh, we got the lo-fi horror guy, Ted Nicolau, on the show today. You guys, Thank take you care, man. For okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, baby.